wonderful, glorious, most important resurrection for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I kind of backed into teaching last week, and I had forgotten I was teaching this week because mostly I teach in children's right now. So I didn't realize I was going to have two Sabbath school lessons that were so interconnected. <laughs> and we touched on a lot of things last week. Um, oh, thank you, John. I am hoping for participation. We touched on a lot of things that included both death and resurrection. And if you remember the universe and the law of the universe and all of those things, so I wasn't sure where to go this week, but as I was studying, I discovered last week um, a new site that I didn't know about. It's called Sabbath.school. Now, that's pretty easy to remember. If you go to Sabbath.school, you can have a link to absolutely everything that Adventists put out just about. You can get 3ABN, you can get Talking Points, you can get It Is Written, you can get Hope Channel, you can get the Teacher's Guide, you can get the Student Guide, you can get the Easy Reading Guide, you can get audio reading you the Sabbath School lesson, you can get visual things, and they have a PowerPoint already created. And this PowerPoint isn't my usual style, so I thought about it off and on all week, whether or not I'd use it. But it does organize it very well, and because we didn't use it last week, it'll have some fresh things. Good morning, Doris. Nice to see you here in class. Um, so a couple things left over that before we actually start through the slides, I want to mention. If you have your Bible with you or your device or the Bible in front of you, Something that I learned this week from a different source than Sabbath school that I want to share with you is in John 12, 32, I do believe. It's the text that most of us know, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said to signify the way that he would die. Now, do you notice that peoples, or if you have a version that says men, that it's italicized? Um, maybe, I don't know if it is in, uh, in a mobile device or not, but in true translations, it needs to be italicized because it is not in the original. And I have the most clever um, program <laughs> called Logos, and I can look at any, um, any of the translations, and then I can click this little button that then shows me the Greek and the Hebrew, and, and if I hover over the number there, it takes me right to the Strong's Concordance or the, or the Greek and Hebrew lexicon or whatever, and tells me what, in English, what this really means and why they translated it this way. And I'm just, I'm going nuts with this. This is like a game, you know? And... So what, there's, what I'm finding from this, even though so, some people say people, which seems better than just men, there are versions that say all things, and you think, God, what things is God drawing to himself, you know? I just want to take you back to what we talked about last week, and that is everything that happens on this earth and that has happened in the plan of salvation is for the universe. And we don't know what beings on other planets are called. They are probably not him and her. And they may not even be people. They are beings that God created and may or may not be way more magnificent than us. Well, they're obviously more magnificent because they haven't had sin. But all of them have had the opportunity to fall and to have sin. So just the fact that the humanoid element is not really in the original language in that verse supports for me, in my mind, the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he drew everything to himself. Okay? 
Remember, last week we talked about when he said, it is finished, it was not. Sometimes Adventists say, well, how can it be finished if we're still going through the investigative judgment or we don't, I don't know if I'm going to be saved for sure or not, all of those things. We say because we think about ourselves, <laughs> which is the bottom line of sin. We focus on ourselves because that's our own whole experience. But I thought it was neat that John 12, 32 actually says that when he was lifted up and he said it is finished, he drew everything in the entire universe to himself. And another thing that we talked about just briefly, we talked about when we die, some people say, well, we've gone back to the mind of God or we just don't exist at all. Or I like to use, it's a computer file that's been closed. Everything we've done and are is written, so that program is us. And when we die, it's a dormant, sleeping um, file. The reason I said, I said that um, I wasn't sure about in the mind of God, the one thing about that we need to keep clear is we are not part of God. And there is not part of God in us other than the breath. We are a workmanship of his. We are a creation. And Satan wants us all to feel like we are partly divine. And that's why the many of the translations, instead of saying sleep, they say sleep is a euphemism. And if you say sleep, then it leads people to the, to the wrong doctrine of soul sleep which of course is what we believe that there is no consciousness anyway that's another that's another thing but those were left over from last week and I just wanted to touch on them so this week we're not focusing on the lifted up we're focusing on the sleeping in the tomb and our memory verse this week is we can read it together since it's there from the New Century Version. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He put his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and to the place of the dead. Now, there in that verse is another translation where the different translations you look at are going to be different. Sometimes there in that verse, it says Hades. Sometimes it says the grave. Sometimes it says the place of the dead. Couldn't, can't the translation people make up their mind? So I went back again to look at, so what does the Greek really say? And there really are two terms. This one says place of the dead. That does not imply the same as um, the two terms. So do if you have a New King James, which I looked it up in two, or another version, are there two different words, Barb, for you? Uh, for which Revelation 1, 18. and of death okay there's two words the key is of hell and of death so you see originally in this one here it says the place of the dead and this is where we get confused sometimes and when we have a hard time explaining to other people hello we have a hard time explaining to other people how we feel the by what the, we feel the bible is saying about um what we're reading because we're not sure why the translators in one version said it this way and one version said it that way. But when I again went back to the Greek, um, there are two words closely related and one is for the process and one is for the place. So what is happening to you when you die is a process. And where you go after you die, that's a place. So you can see why different 
different translators with different understandings sometimes say Hades, sometimes say uh, the, de uh, the grave, sometimes they just say the place of the dead, which doesn't include the process. But we know the process is the going back to God of the breath so that we are not a viable living agency anymore. And we know that the place of the dead is wherever the dead are. <laughs> and that's all kind of places nowadays, you know? Some of them are in laboratories, some of them are in dirt, some of them are in water, some of them are those places. So we know, though, that this lesson is about Jesus conquering all of that. What happens to you and where you are. And from what we discussed last week, we are no longer conscious which I love to equate to a computer file being closed and in the database in heaven. And we are, um, we are in a state not of annihilation because we, are, we have not had the final judgment. And God is just letting there be a phase for time to continue and to continue and continue until he has all the people that he um, have had a chance to know about him, etc. So let's go on to the first part of our lesson. The death of Jesus at the cross is the basis of our redemption. That's from Colossians 1.14. And I think... I'd like you to look that up if you have a device. However, a dead Savior cannot save anyone. Christ is risen. So are there, is there anyone who has a comment about that or has a question or a problem with the fact that Christ is risen? Can anybody venture a guess of what would life be like for you if Christ wasn't risen? There'd be no hope, and that's what this quarter's lessons are about. Um, so Colossians 1.14, would you read that for us, um, Barb? Do you have the... Okay. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So let's read 13. Who Two. hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay. In May I ask what version you have are reading from? King, or King James. King James? I think it is. Okay. <laughs> Not Apple? No. No. Um, so that says, dear son. And um, there are other versions that say, only begotten son, because we have that other translation. Or the son, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what other, pardon? Son he, loves. son he loves. That's what I wanted to get us to. Um, and what I like even better is the one that says, the son of his love. Now, when I look at that phrase, that opens up the possibility of much, much deeper meaning. God is love. And in order to do what he did for us, which was follow his own government of other-centered love and create a sacrifice or I don't even, that word needs context to create the plan that would get us back from the kidnapper, he let there be out of himself a son. It's not like man, woman come together and bear a child. But God knew that something called a son that we could very much relate to would come from the Godhead and be our salvation. Does that does that make sense? Because of his love. It's the son of his love. Not just the pampered child, the pampered only child who gets everything he wants, which 
was Jesus, and Satan really got all jealous and in a tiff because this only son gets everything he wants, and Satan wanted it. That leads us right into our human way of thinking. But this is God, who is other-centered love, making sure there was a son from God that would come and become human, a part of God itself that would become human and would create this salvation plan. Does that resonate with you at all, or am I just woo, way out in left field? <laughs> I love that, that phrasing, and it's in, um, this one's in the New King James. I don't know which other versions. The son of his love. Um, and it's not so absolutely clear when you get back to the Greek, but when you go back to the Greek, you are, as an English person, with the experiences you have, making the best of what the Greek said. And that's what the translators, who are very educated people, do too. But with a certain amount of bias, which the Holy Spirit always controls. The Holy Spirit never lets it be said something that people can't figure out with, with the Holy Spirit. One version might say one thing, but then it's good to compare with other versions and to let, of course, prayer and the Holy Spirit guide us. But now we're going to look at... Um, like I said, this isn't my PowerPoint, but we will use it. We are going to look at the, the breakout of this lesson. The resurrection of Jesus marks the final victory over sin and death. It also guarantees our own resurrection. So... These are the main components of our lesson. The resurrection of Jesus. We're going to look at the hindrances to that, the victory related to that. We're going to look at the witnesses of the resurrection, those who were resurrected with him, those who saw him. We're going to look at the importance of the resurrection because if Christ is not risen, then... And we're going to look at how absolutely, you know, I, I like writing. I like historical fiction. I like plot lines. I like how they're woven together and whatever. Sometimes life isn't that neat. But boy, God let this be so neat. All the threads that were necessary came together. Because in order to go to all the trouble... There, you have to go to a lot of trouble to prove that, to try to prove that Christ wasn't risen. God set up so many things that are almost irrefutable, even if you don't want to believe in, in God, and don't want to believe that Jesus is your Savior. It is very hard to put your head in the sand and say, the man named Jesus did not rise, because there are so many witnesses to it. So let's look at the actual resurrection of Jesus. And the first thing we were talking about was the hindrance. The hindrances to, to him being resurrected. So if you were convinced that Jesus isn't God, but he claimed to be, and there's just a chance somebody will try to convince you that he is, you go to some trouble to prove that he isn't. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. What do you think about that? Has that ever happened in history before? You want somebody dead so bad that you actually seal up the tomb and set a guard over it? Don't, we should have done that for Hitler. Right? What's the chance? Maybe he has an immortal soul and he... <laughs> so there was a lot of angst. A stone, a seal, and some Roman soldiers were put in place to prevent Jesus' disciples from stealing his body. And you know what? Um, they weren't even that bright, I don't think. 
<laughs> that they could have come up with a major um, hoax that would last throughout a long, long time. So Jesus' disciples were just some coward Galileans. They ran away when Jesus was arrested and they were hiding somewhere in Jerusalem for fear of the Jews. So they weren't really a threat, were they? And still, the Romans put, egged on by the Jews, put a, a guard there. The priests and the Pharisees were not afraid of the disciples. They were afraid of Jesus. Satan encouraged them to prevent Jesus from getting out of the tomb himself. How, if we compare the troubles of those times with the troubles of these times, who are the Jews? Who are the commandment-keeping, obedient Saturday worshiping, tithe paying people. Basically, that would be the church yeah. back then <clears throat> and the church leadership. It would be church leadership. And one of the things in the lovely little book we're reading on Wednesday night that, um, that Larry recommended to us, and we're all so thankful, um, Closing Prayers by Maxwell. There's a line in there that really resonates with me. And... I've always thought of de the delusions, the delusions of the last day. Um, what's, the, what's the phrase I want? Last day delusions. Last day delusions are going to be fake news, people coming online tell, trying to tell you this or that, um, government saying we're going to solve this or that. But he's saying, what is the most deceitful? Deception Last day deception. The word deception comes from the word deceit, right? What's the most deceitful thing we're told in the Bible? The human heart is the most deceitful thing. We are deceived by ourselves and desperately wicked, even when we think we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. There's something in our hearts that still is attached to the satanic lies we've lived with all our lives. And um, so last day deceptions can be coming from inside our hearts. That really hit me between the, between the eyes. So the whole Laodicean, when you put that with the whole Laodicean message, you're okay. You go to church on Sabbath. You pay tithe. You take care of people that need help. Kind of, sort of, when it's convenient. Yes, ma'am. Angela. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, there's a scripture that says that to love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a horrible confusion about the fact that the heart is, there, there's been some major research done about that scripture. It's been mistranslated for your information. And it, it doesn't exactly mean that our hearts are evil. And, and that's a wrong connotation because, you know, we think of Christ and Jesus living in our hearts. So Absolutely. it's very confusing. And we have to be very careful how we look at that because you could be afraid of your own heart. You know, it says trust your heart, people will Absolutely. say. Absolutely. And, you know, follow your heart. And, and it's true because that's where God is. So I, I just want to be really careful. Right. You're right. When we have actively the Holy Spirit in our heart, when every day we surrender our lives to the Holy Spirit, when we say, take me today is completely yours. I lay all my plans at your feet. Use me in your service. Abide in me. Then he is going to lead us, and he will lead us through thoughts of our heart and some feelings of our heart. But the minute we get arrows of thoughts that come to us constantly from outside of us that are not from the Holy Spirit because there are other spirits. And we have thoughts and ideas that come to us. And if in our own power we are facing them, we can easily let them get inside of us. 
I know uh, exactly what Angela's saying. We can resist melancholy, and yet there are moments in our day when we are tired and we are weak and we get this overwhelming depression and we can just go with that and we can act out of that and we can snap out of that. We are not totally sanctified <laughs> yet, but your point is well taken. There can be, Christ can be in our heart and also we can sometimes succumb to the flesh. We could just put it that way. So here we are with the good people. And we won't say that they have good hearts because I don't believe the Holy Spirit was leading them. They were being led by human, um, what felt good to them, what felt right to them. And sometimes it is doing everything right. We sin the most. I love this quotation. It comes from a, a book, but I do believe it. Uh, we sin the most when we are in the right and right isn't happening for us. So when we've been doing everything right and we're obeying everything and we're following the Holy Spirit in our heart and yet life still keeps messing up and people still keep criticizing us and, and events keep happening and this should not be happening because we've got such pure, beautiful hearts and, and then our reaction can be one of bitterness or resentment or doubt or all sorts of things. And that can be the sin for, the, for those who are trying to live, right? So she's bringing it. Um, just to take off a little bit on that is, you know, we can't, you know, certainly feelings and circumstances affect decisions and what we believe to be right and wrong, but we can't base what is right solely on our feelings or on our circumstances because right. they can be very misleading. Mm -hmm. And so when it boils down to it, we have to base it on God's word and on our relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit in our heart. And sometimes what we feel is not in harmony with that. Right. And so I think everything we have to test it by God's word, by his spirit, and we may and not by our feelings because we can even Christians, we can be deceived by our feelings mm -hmm. because we're human right. and we give in to temptation and we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. We're not totally sanctified yet. So and I know Ellen White talks a lot about that too, especially near the end time. In um, the book Maranatha, there's one um, daily reading in, in July, I don't remember the date, but it's talking about the very end time when it's just, you know, a few people, God's remnant people, and it says if, if um, you know, we're saying that we are blessed of God, all circumstances appear against us, and so are we going to trust and follow God because this is in his word, this is right, that's where true faith comes in, or are we going to go along with what our feelings or what other people are going to say? And don't misunderstand, often we can be in the wrong and other people can help us see things differently. God sends people, but I'm just when it gets right down to it, if it's not according to God's word, we can't base it on what's right on anything else. Right. And unfortunately, a lot of times we are slow in understanding what God's word is saying. That's what was happening to the disciples, right? Jesus had been saying his word to them. He had been saying, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to die. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to rise on the third day. And they didn't hear it. They, they couldn't compare because they were filled with self, <laughs> So the victory, what's so victorious about this um, whole event? And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Now, sometimes people like to find quibbles in the, in the Bible, and one gospel says, an angel, and another gospel says two angels, and one gospel says Mary was there first, and another gospel says this. But I was reminded that we take the biggest picture. 
the broadest picture is probably the correct one because this person was writing and that's all they saw or that's all they were tuned into and it just was oblivious. You know, sometimes you can say to your spouse or to somebody, oh, well, so-and-so wasn't even there. And they, oh, yes, they were. You were just focused on so-and-so. Um, so we don't always see, but um, so an angel, at least one, but we know more than one, came and all of the human paraphernalia to try to keep Jesus in the grave was of no account. I mean, no matter what plans we make here on earth, God can just melt them, right? <laughs> the stone, the seal, and the guards trembled before the presence of one angel of God. When the father called him, the son took the life he had surrendered back. And we find support for that in Acts and in John. The elders bribed the guards to make the people believe the impossible, that the soldiers had fallen asleep and that the disciples had removed the strong and noisy stone, taking the body of Jesus with them. Wasn't that a much, if you understand God, <laughs> isn't that a much bigger to-do than just the fact that God opened it? That, that's totally living in the realm of the human. And to even believe that that would happen was so um, over, uh, what would you call it? <laughs> the, the, like we said before, the disciples were not that smart and the Romans were not that dumb <laughs> that that could have happened. Yes, that's Sandy. And also the guards weren't, the guards weren't put to death which normally they would have been. Yes, for, right. For falling asleep. Absolutely. something so important to leadership at the time, but they were let go with no punishment. Yeah, absolutely. That, that in itself um, <laughs> says a lot about the determination of the Jews, doesn't it? Um, and maybe even the wealth, of the, the wealth of the leaders, the Jewish leaders. <laughs> The failed attempts to prevent Jesus' victory only managed to make some scared soldiers proclaim that Jesus had been resurrected. Christ came forth from the tomb glorified and the Roman guard beheld him. Now we know that God had a lot of, you know how all things work together for good and it's a tapestry and God is working it out. And even though the main purpose possibly in our mind was that everyone would know that Jesus was raised. There are some wonderful books, um, fictional books, because we don't know for sure, about some of those Roman guards and what their life must have been like after that. You would think that of how all those guards, at least one would have had an honest heart and would have said, oh my goodness, what's going on here? And... Uh, I know I've read some stories along those lines, which is just our imagination, but God doesn't let any chance of, of getting through to a soul go unnoticed. So, so that wasn't the only thing, was it? Um, let's talk, that was the victory, but now let's talk about the witnesses to this. Could, could I just quick say yeah. this? Uh -huh. My translation was so different on, on that. I just wanted to point it out. So, um, verse 24. So, whom God raised up, God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So, God raised him up. So, it said right there in your translation that um, he took back the, um, took back the, no, the, the, surrender his you know unsurrendered right like took back so it's but it says god raised up having right. loosed the pains of death god not that he took back you know the surrendered whatever you know it, that was just i don't know and then it says because he should that he should be there was not possible that he should be held by it but god was the not that jesus you know took back well excuse me but to me, I mean, they're all, I think they're all involved, and there is a study where we can look at where was the Holy Spirit acting, where was the Father acting, where was Jesus acting, but God is the name of all of them. 
And, and so you're right, absolutely. Um, the power that was in Jesus, the power that is his Father, the power that is in the Holy Spirit, they all are acting together because there was no sin to hold Jesus to death. The only, death was only, and I don't want to use the word invented, but death only happens because sin happened. Because someone said the way God has organized the universe to be all of us giving unselfishly to each other and praise back to God, because someone broke that, the result of that was going to be death. It's not, a, it's not a punishment. It's not an arbitrary punishment. It is a result, a result of going against the way God made everything. And so when God became human and human was going to die because of sin, whoops, well, that human didn't, couldn't be held because that human had never sinned and that human was still God. And we, any one of us now, I love what my son calls it, um, he is the battery pack, <laughs> okay? God provided a battery pack. Every one of us were going to run out of juice because we had snipped that connection with God. Once that connection with God is snipped by disobeying, saying, you know, and not disobey, I don't even like that word, by deciding to do it our way, Eve said, hey, I'll do it my way. I might get smarter. I might get to do things God wouldn't let me do. That snipped that connection. But Jesus came and never let that connection be snipped, and so he was an ever, he's an energizer bunny pack. And any of us who want to take advantage of that and be in him, we will be energizer bunnies too. Yes. I'm glad, Kathy, you're talking about the, you know, the Holy Spirit. So a lot of people are afraid to talk about it because mm. it's kind of mysterious. And, but if, if you don't have it, you know, like I, I always say, I was Jehovah's Witness 40 years, you know, and mm -hmm. it was a 40-year tapestry of just a few scriptures. Yeah. And when it started collapsing, you know, you start to think, is this the devil calling me out of here? And, I, and I've, I've been in a lot of different churches, the Mormon church, and there's a tapestry of scriptures they use, and they sound very convincing, you know, covenants and doctrines. And, but if you don't have the Holy Spirit, right. you, you won't be able to sort it out. Right. You'll just be invited into an indoctrination, and you could be just as lost. And, you know, I mean, I preached genocide for years to people that didn't believe exactly like I did. I really did. I call it religious racism. And I was like, wow. And so now, as Christ is born in us, right? Mm -hmm. The Christ, whatever, he's alive today, it's alive today. And it, it will transform us mm -hmm. to where we have the mind of Christ. Living the mind of Christ, temple. absolutely, yep. absolutely. I'm watching our time slip here. I want to show you all the cute pictures I have. <laughs> the stones that covered the tombs of Saint, some saints were removed by an earthquake. This was the part that is, was really... I had to really cogitate on this a lot. And the wording in the scripture is not real, real clear, except that um, the earthquake that happened when Jesus died disturbed some graves. But the people actually came forth, came to life again when Jesus paid that final, well, not paid, when, the, when Jesus, the energizer, came back out and said, hey, death cannot hold me, and he took people with him. Uh, and they, here's again, you have the how many hundreds of soldiers who are witness, and they're going around saying, okay, they told me not to say, but this is what really happened, and did you know what? My dad was there, and he said this, and so the word is spreading, no matter how much money the Jews have paid. And then you have these people and somewhere in my studies, I heard that we know that one is David, and I don't know how we know that. I need to study that out if there's somewhere else in the Bible. But people from previous life to Jesus, who had died before Jesus, some of them came forth uh, when he came forth and could go about and um, say, yeah, <laughs> Look at me, I, I was dead, 
But now I'm alive, and, and we are told that they went with Jesus when he finally ascended. So let's look at the, the list here of those who saw him. We have um, several witnesses. We have the group of women. We have the Roman guards. We have Mary Magdalene, and those are the verses. Uh, they're all in your Sabbath school quarterly. The disciples that were on their road to Emmaus, Emmaus. We have Peter, who is pointed out because he's one who had said, I don't know him. And Jesus is very lovingly going through a long sequence of relating to him back and letting him know, yeah, but I know you. And if you want to still be with me, you can. Um, those that were gathered in the upper room, Thomas. Now, I want to say something about Thomas. From the, the E.G. White, so you know the press puts together a little booklet and it has quotes that go with the Sabbath school lesson. They were not inspired by any particular person that they belong to the Sabbath school lesson. A thoughtful person who we all know very well spends time gathering them and just thinking, well, these would be good commentary thoughts to go with it. And I want to, I want to share with you from the SDA Bible commentary a paragraph about Thomas that the compiler found. Jesus, in his treatment of Thomas, gave his followers a lesson regarding the manner in which they should treat those who have doubts upon religious truth and who make those doubts prominent. He does not overwhelm, he did not overwhelm Thomas with words of reproach, nor did he enter into a controversy with him. But with marked condescension and tenderness, he revealed himself unto the doubting one. Thomas had taken a most unreasonable position in dictating the only condition of his faith like, I will not believe him unless I can put my hand in his side. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. But Jesus, by his generous love and consideration, broke down all the barriers Thomas had raised. Persistent controversy will seldom weaken unbelief. <gasps> Hello, Tim Leo. How are you? will seldom weaken unbelief, but rather put it upon self-defense where it will find new support and excuse. Do we sometimes do that? I, I'm visiting a lady just down the road here who went, she and her husband went to all the meetings at the Cloverdale Church a few months ago. And they kept having discussions with the evangelist because they didn't see eye to eye. And they felt, they left their feeling a little, yeah, but, you know, we're not ready to buy this refrigerator yet. <laughs> we're not ready to sign on the installment plan to be Adventist. And, and there's been a little bit of concern in their hearts about that. Jesus never did that. Only further self-defense will come from that. Jesus revealed in his love and mercy as the crucified Savior will bring from many once unwilling lips the acknowledgement of Thomas, my Lord and my God. Jesus was so patient with Thomas. And then we have more than 500. I didn't really know about this group, which mostly talked about in 1 Corinthians. And I, I need to go study some more about that. And then James, his own brother, who wasn't part of any of these discipleship groups, possibly. So we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, that's where a lot of these are from. And then Paul. And many of us will say, well, Jesus was already dead. How come Paul is calling himself an apostle? An apostle is someone who's seen Jesus. But we have Two, one reason for that, and one that I'm just coming to think about and may begin to own, and that is, of course, he saw him on the road to Emmaus. But we, well, that was kind of a vision. But apparently, it was very, very real. Jesus came, not the road to Emmaus, the road to Damascus, and he stopped him and he said, I'm Jesus, you've been persecuting me. 
But something we don't talk about a lot is that Paul went to another country away from all the other people and the apostles and everything and spent three years being taught of the Lord. So in a way, Paul had the same amount of time as the other apostles with Jesus. But part of it was, well, all of it was after he had been resurrected. Paul was a very, very special person and had a very, very special job to do, which was to take these truths to the world um, and to do it in such a manner that the intellectual Greeks and the, all the other kinds of Gentiles who were not steeped in Judaism would understand. So um, let's look quickly at the importance of the resurrection. If Christ is not risen from the dead and has become the first fruits, he has risen and he's become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. So who can tell me we don't use that word first fruits now very much? And like I said, I, I didn't gather these. They're beautiful slides. They're not my style. But that apparently is a first fruit sheaf. And in the agricultural day when this was happening, what are the first fruits? So they take the very best and the first harvested, the, you know, you would probably say the first pressing of olive oil. <laughs> and they, they dedicate it to God. And Jesus is the first fruit of all the people who will be saved. Not Moses who's already in heaven, not Elijah who's already in heaven, not the widow's son who was raised. None of that is first fruit, even Methuselah. There, remember, they're, they're on credit card. <laughs> Jesus is the first fruit. And it represents the whole harvest, which includes us. So is that hope or what? That is definitely... Um, so that clock is slower than our clock. Okay. Pardon? Two minutes that says three, so I'm going to listen to that. So let's look at um, 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 14, it says that our preaching makes sense because of the resurrection. We testify that God is truthful. We believe that we also will be resurrected. We have faith that our sins are forgiven. We'll see those who have died again. We have hope in a better life. Finally, the resurrection of Jesus guarantees that the last enemy, death, will be defeated. Now, I want to share, there was um, a quotation here to end, which is lovely about Christ raising and being the first fruit. But again, in those quotations that are gathered together for our lesson, there's one that I want to leave you with because it's really... I hope our response to all of this. This is what it says. The value that God places on the work of his hands, the love he has for his children, is revealed by the gift he made to redeem men. Adam fell under the dominion of Satan. He brought sin into the world and death by sin. God gave his only begotten son to save man. This he did that he might be just and yet the justifier of all who accept Christ. Man sold himself to Satan, but Jesus bought back the race. There you have my born kidnapped motif. You are not your own. Jesus has purchased you with his blood. Do not bury your talents in the earth. Use them for him. In whatever business you may be engaged, bring Jesus into it. If you find that you are losing your love for your Savior, give up your business and say, Here I am, Savior. Thou, what wilt thou have me to do? He will receive you graciously and love you freely. He will abundantly pardon, for he is merciful and long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. We and all that we have belong to God. We should not regard it as a sacrifice to give him the affection of our hearts. The heart itself should be given to him as a willing offering. 
I thought that was a beautiful way to end um, this lesson. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you. Just thank you. And here we are. Please take us. In Jesus' name, amen.